Well, welcome everyone. My name is Norman Dova, and I am the director of the Bunch Horseman Center for Jewish Studies here at the University of Florida, and I am delighted to see you here today uh, for sessions which will take place this afternoon and also tomorrow afternoon. The title of this conference is Ukraine and the Jews, uh, an interdisciplinary conference. Um, my colleague, Vardan Yuzich, uh, and I started talking about this one. While back, um, and, and the idea was to, to do something um, interdisciplinary where uh, the, the papers and talks would kind of speak uh, to one another uh, over, over this uh, problem, both in terms of history uh, and literature, but also contemporary politics. So we think that this will make um, a very interesting series of discussions uh, and a very good volume uh, as well. I want to thank Vergon uh, for putting this together. I'd also like to thank uh, our guests, our very distinguished guests, uh, some of whom have come uh, from particularly long uh, distances, uh, so welcome. Uh, and uh, some of you, some of you I see, uh, I've seen in uh, Zoom events, you know, back during the, the dark COVID years, others I've seen in conferences, and I'm really looking forward to um, hearing you again. Um, it's also not an accident uh, that we uh, have a couple of our own faculty um, presenting, and I am very proud uh, of this fact that we have faculty of this kind of stature, Seth Bernstein and Natalia Alexion. Um, it, it promises to be a very interesting couple of days. And very quickly, I want to thank um, our staff, uh, Alex Lowy um, and Amanda Bouquet. Um, who have proven themselves wonderful at uh, putting things together kind of at the last minute and this kinds of all of these sorts of things and I can be handling um, the, the, some of the catering aspects but also um, the, uh, the uh, streaming and recording and all of that. So without further ado, we're going to turn things over to our organizer of my own music. Thank you, Norm. Good afternoon. My name is Dragan Kujundzic. I'm a professor in Jewish studies here at the University of Florida. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to Ukraine and Jews, the first conference in our program since we officially became the Bud Shorstein Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Florida. And I'm all the more grateful that on this occasion I can welcome again Amelia Glazer, professor of Slavic and chair of Judaic studies at the University of California in San Diego. We were delighted that she attended a round table organized here via Zoom around her latest monograph book, Songs in Dark Times, Yiddish Poetry of Struggle from Scottsboro to Palestine, published by Harvard University Press in 2020. We got it hot from the presses at the time. Uh, and since then, uh, to discuss it, I mean, it was just published. Since then, the book has been awarded the 2021 Schnitzer Award in Jewish Literature and Linguistics. I could not think of anyone better qualified to speak on the topic of Ukraine and the Jews in ways of introduction, given Amelia's sustained reflections on the theme of Ukrainian Jewish relations. This was the topic of her first monograph. Jews and Ukrainians in Russia's Literary Borderlands, from the Shtetl Fair to the Petersburg Bookshop, uh, published in 2012, followed by her edited volume, Stories of Khmelnytsky, Competing Literary Legacies of the 1648 Ukrainian Cossack Uprising, um, which uh, was published by Stanford University Press in 2015. Most recently, Amelia co-edited and translated a short course in Molotov Cocktails, poems translated from Ukrainian with Yulia Ilchuk, just now appeared in spring 2023, not a volume on mixology, I presume. Molotov Cocktails? No, but Amazon <laughs> did wait a while to put it up for uh, that reason. Uh, it was very, uh, at the very beginning of her academic career, uh, 
Amelia published a volume of translated poetry from Yiddish called Prolet Pen, America's Rebel Yiddish Poets, that she co-edited and annotated with David Weintraub, for which she was awarded the MLA Fenner and Yaakov Levoyant Memorial Prize for Translation in Yiddish Studies, and the Choice Award for Outstanding Academic Titles. Her enduring commitment to translation, both in theory and practice, are what constitutes one of the most productive and fascinating aspects of her work. In her Songs of Dark Times, rewriting Ukraine and translations are discussed at length. Amelia's research in itself warrants the title of this conference and provides a useful colloquium by leading scholars working on various aspects of this theme. It needs little explaining that Ukraine is one of the most discussed topics in current politics. In fact, Amelia Glazer contributed to the public debate about Ukraine and especially issues pertaining to Jews and Ukraine in venues such as the New York Times, CNN, the Times Literary Supplement and the Jewish Journal. I wonder if you ever sleep. The Jews in Ukraine experienced racism, anti-Semitism, deportations, pogroms, the Holocaust, and continued repression in the Soviet Union after World War II. Nevertheless, they managed to foster great religious figures, artists, writers, and politicians in Israel and in the diaspora. In more recent times, another Ukraine has emerged, one that has fully integrated its Jewish population on equal terms in the essential fibers of the nation brutally attacked by the Russian Federation. Ukraine has become the place where European politics is redefined, some might say where it goes to die, and the entire inheritance of the Cold War is currently reassessed. Ukraine's President Zelensky, a Russian-speaking Ukrainian of Jewish background, rose to the challenge and has become one of the most prominent world statements, uh, statesmen. His Jewishness has recently provoked numerous and vicious anti-Semitic attacks on the part of Putin's regime. It is also uh, this whole uh, issue of uh, Ukrainian Jews raise debate more generally about Jews, who or what they are in the current post-communist transformation of Ukraine and beyond. This is why I asked our participants to share their reflection on these topics, which we intend to gather and publish as a volume as well as Professor Goda mentioned. This event will be followed by other scholars event invited lecture on the same topic in the spring of 2024. Conferences are collective endeavor. I benefited greatly from advice and encouragement of my colleagues, Michael Bernard and Aida Hozic, and I want to thank them for their support and ideas. I received unwavering support to organize the event from Norman Goda, director of the Bat Shorstein Center for Jewish Studies, and have greatly benefited from discussions with my colleague Natalia Alexiun. I'm particularly grateful that her advice result, resulted in bringing to this conference Marta Havrishko, director of the Babinyar Holocaust Memorial Center and research associate of National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. The conference is supported by the Norman and Bremen Chair, that would be Norma and Bremen Chair uh, in Holocaust Studies, the Harry Rich Chair in Holocaust Studies, and the Alexander Grass Chair in Jewish Studies. We in the center are as ever grateful for their support. Last but not least, I want to thank again Kyra Riley, Amanda Bouquet, and Alex Lowy, who have been tireless in making conference arrangements. The order of the day, Amelia's lecture will be followed by a coffee break in the Center for Jewish Studies, and after that we'll, we will reconvene to screen a very recent film by Michael Hewitt, Ukraine Holocaust Ground Zero, the first and exclusive such screening any place after it, its initial release on Channel 4 in the UK three weeks ago. The screening will be followed by a Zoom interview with the author and producer Michael Hewitt. Tomorrow, the conference will reconvene in Pew Hall 210 at 11 a.m. 
and we'll include our campus guests, Marta Havrishko and Lisa Wakamia, to Zoom lectures and lecture by our UF colleagues. They will be catered coffee breaks. The program of the conference in our, uh, events webs is an, on our events website, JST at UF, and we put some uh, conference programs out as well. Without further ado, I welcome you all to the conference, and please join me in welcoming to the floor Professor Amelia Glazer, who will speak on reimagining community, Jewish cultural history, and Ukraine's civic turn. Amelia, welcome to UF. Thank you so much for that introduction and for inviting me to be here, Dragan. It's really a pleasure to be in this stunningly beautiful room. Um, I didn't get to appreciate this on the Zoom uh, panel that we had a couple of years ago. Uh, the last decade, and especially the last year and a half since the full-scale invasion, has made my field of study weirdly relevant. Uh, if it's taken a war to no, have the rest of the world notice that Ukraine has this really fascinating relationship to its subcultures. Uh, this is something that people in this room have seen for a while. Um, and I want to thank, uh, before I, I go any further, my colleagues and students who have participated in my research that I'm going to be presenting for you today. First of all, I want to thank my colleague, uh, Yulia Ilchuk, who will be presenting via Zoom, I believe, at this conference a little bit later. Yulia and I are co-translators. We've been collaborating for about five or six years on translating Ukrainian poetry, and this is our most recent product of that collaboration. Um, also, Gabriela Safran and Ananditya Banerjee published a, an issue of comparative literature that came out a couple of months ago on anti the legacy of anti-racisms um, and socialism, and uh, many of the things that I'm going to be saying today are drawn from a piece that I contributed to that. And I also want to thank my students. I'm only mentioning three of them here, but Paige Lee, Nian Mashurov, and Reem Tashia Khan are all students that have been working with me on building a contemporary Ukrainian poetry database, which is part of my ongoing research into contemporary Ukrainian poetry. And then the, the poets writing in Ukraine, whose work I'm going to be drawing from today. Um, so what I want to do with this platform that Dragan has generously given me is to suggest that Ukraine offers us and also offers our colleagues beyond the fields of Jewish studies and Slavic studies uh, a model for thinking about how ethnic identity might not only be invented, as Benedict Anderson has you know, told us, but, uh, but reinvented, reimagined. Uh, so you know, perhaps we can think about contemporary Ukraine as developing a vocabulary for thinking about a reimagined nationhood, which is something that's incredibly hard to do. Um, so this is a potentially hopeful message in a time that is otherwise quite dark. Uh, the photo that you see on this slide is from March 3rd, 2022, shortly after a Russian missile hit a TV tower um, and one of the off-site museum structures for the Babinyar Memorial, and, uh, and it killed five civilians. Following the attack, President Volodymyr Zelensky addressed the nation and said, we all died again in Babinyar from a missile attack. This address was posted along with, interestingly, a Hebrew translation to Zelensky's various social media pages. And I, I found that the fact that Ukrainians might identify with the, the missile attack with the Babinyar, with the collective experience of death in the Holocaust as a national tragedy is something that's, that's somewhat new. And I believe that's due in part to a changing discourse over the past decade around Ukrainian collective trauma. I date this roughly to 10 years ago, the beginning of the Maidan or Revolution of Dignity, Revolutia Hidnasti in 2013-2014. Um, but this was a moment when Ukrainian discussions of national memory and tragedy started to become much more inclusive than they had been. I believe that one way that people have done that is by extending a poetics of collective memory to include a more inclusive we in Ukraine. Um, right now, I'm primarily interested in how poets are doing this, how poets are kind of leading a vanguard in changing the discourse. Uh, but over the past decade, and, and especially over the last 20 months, there's been a shift in the way that Ukrainians define a collective understanding of identity, of national identity. Linguistic signifiers that once defined a single ethnic subculture in Ukraine have been expanded to become more inclusive. 
So these specific signifiers in Zelensky's quote here, those might be babinyar, for example, are, um, are terms that in my last book I referred to as passwords. And I'm using the same framework in slightly different terms to look at contemporary Ukrainian poets right now. Um, in my last book, Songs in Dark Times, which treated modernist Yiddish writers uh, in the 1930s, um, although, of course, the title Songs in Dark Times might easily apply to the, the contemporary poets, um, I, I was looking at untranslatable terms, passwords, if you will, that were applied by poets in order to extend the meaning of group Jewish identity to include other groups, African Americans, uh, Spanish Republicans fighting in the Civil War, Ukrainians, uh, Palestinian Arabs. And these were often terms drawn from Jewish history and memory like pogrom, Katega or a heavenly judge. Sometimes they were also terms drawn from the other traditions that they were entering. Scottsboro, for example, no pasaran in the case of the Spanish Civil War. So in Zelensky's case, by speaking about Babinyar using this collective we, he's linking all Ukrainians to the mass tragedy of the Holocaust. A pretty bold move. Arguably, one of Zelensky's most important efforts as president has been to help demonstrate this unified we that defines Ukraine today. Um, so the fact that Ukrainians could identify with a missile attack on Babinyar as a national tragedy is part of this changing discourse around collective trauma. And uh, I want to just bring in, for example, this quote from Mariana Kianowska's 2017 book, Babinyar Holosami, or Babinyar in Voices. Um, this is a, a series of poems written in the voices of the victims of the single largest World War II massacre on Soviet soil, which took place outside of Kiev. Uh, in late September 1941, over the course of two days, tens of thousands of people were mass murdered by gunshot into a ravine um, on the, the outskirts of then Nazi-occupied Kyiv. Uh, up to 150,000 people were killed there during the two years of Nazi occupation. Not all of them, but most of them. The overwhelming majority were Jews. So the cycle of poems that Kianowska published in 2017 includes uh, what you see on the slide here. And I'll, I'm not going to read everything in both languages, but I'll read this just to put a little Ukrainian in the, in the air. Ivan Kajanavy, the Vysiat Semwitsa Namov Vavilon, Aletutu Nas Paramishana, Namovia Movchanya, Ikosti. Kocha Deyaki, Naparamishana, Yazi Swayimu is Tritsi Tretio. Ivan says to Nava, this place resembles Babylon, except what's getting mixed are not languages, but silences, bones, even though bodies are kept separate. I, for one, hang on to my folks from 33, you to your newcomers from 41. I'm sending the translation by Oksana Maksimchuk and Max Rozachinsky, which came out very recently with uh, Harvard Ukrainian Institute. So here, quite literally, Kianovska is unearthing competing buried traumas. She's remembering in the same breath 1941, the year of the Babinyar massacre, alongside the Ukrainian losses of 1933, the year of the beginning of the Ukrainian famine, the Holodomor. And she's, she's entering a conversation about how Ukrainian and Jewish post memories, to use Marianne Hirsch's term, have developed in part in opposition to one another. And she's also revealing what's at stake for Ukrainians in including Babinyar in the history of Ukrainian tragedies. Remembering the multiplicity of community losses on Ukrainian soil means broadening an existing narrative of Ukrainian historical trauma, one that in the past has centered on distinctly Ukrainian losses, especially the Holodomor. So, before I go any further, I want to give you a little sense of where I want to go with my time today. Uh, to return to my argument, I want to convince you that Ukraine offers a model for reimagining a collective we, one that may be relevant to other contexts. Uh, and I'm going to draw these comments um, from my own current book project in, in progress, which is about poets serving as a vanguard for reimagining this collective identity. So I'll first say a little bit more about what I mean by this inclusive we. Uh, that I'm seeing in, in today's poetic rhetoric. Second, I want to dip into a little bit of what this salvages, uh, the, what this rejects as well from the history of Ukrainian-Jewish relations. 
I will then return in a bit more detail to what I see as the key mechanism for creating this we, and I'll use this concept of the poetic password, uh, which I developed in Songs and Dark Times, but I'm extending in slightly different ways to, uh, to these Ukrainian writers. Um, and this, this use of, of poetic passwords in the case of Ukraine is in an effort to write certain historical erasures that have plagued Jewish-Ukrainian relations in the past. And then finally, looking forward, I want to ask some questions about what this means. Uh, this is an important point um, that we're in. Russia continues to insist that they have inherited the left-wing Soviet legacy of collectivity and of anti-nationalism, even of anti-colonialism, even as Russian policy has become increasingly nationalist and neocolonialist. I mean, this is the great irony today. Uh, but what I want to attempt to show using poetry is that the mechanism that these, uh, these poets are using for, for expanding the we um, is something that may be borrowed from histories of collectivity that a history of leftist internationalism may not belong with the Soviet legacy of Moscow, perhaps. Um, and this is another kind of larger point that I'm trying to, um, to question, to, to, to push in my, in my research right now. I hope that I'm going to pose more questions than answer. Uh, this will be incredibly useful for me, but I, I believe the most important question that I'm trying to answer with this project more broadly is how addressing past trauma might affect the present and even the future. My firm belief is that poets are moving in the direction of a radical transformation of society, but it's too early to really tell. We're still in the middle of a war, and war can radicalize people. War can also radicalize ideologies. And so I, I want to end with some open questions about how sustainable this moment is. Just to give you a sense of, of some of the faces of the, the poets that I'm working with, the ongoing project considers how contemporary poets in Ukraine are seeking to reimagine Ukrainian identity. Um, and they've done so by reconciling these competing narratives. So um, these are poets largely from really my own generation, poets born between you know, the mid 70s and the early 80s. And um, they came of age after the fall of the Soviet Union, they became more serious poets around the time of the Maidan. Um, and the last 10 years have been years when they have really come into their own as a, as a generation of writers. Um, so it's a, it's a new generation. And it's kind of a new time for the society that they are presenting. So I'll, um, I'll share with you just another example of the strong we that we see in contemporary Ukraine today. Uh, and this is something that Ukrainians have been expressing around the war from Zelensky to the soldiers fighting on the front lines to the poets that are, that are trying to put this into, into words. This is a poem, this is part of a poem, the first two stanzas, written by Iakiva, a poet that uh, Yulia and I are working very closely with right now to finish a volume of her work. Uh, she posted this to Facebook, which has become the primary vehicle for sharing poetry in Ukraine. Interestingly enough, if you have questions about this, I'm happy to answer them, though I won't go into great detail about Facebook poetry in the time that I have. But she also sent it to me and Yulia, and she asked if we would translate it into English for her. The poem articulated something that I'd suspected for the couple of weeks before she wrote it. Um, after the invasion of the full scale invasion of Ukraine. And that was that rather than receiving humanitarian aid from other countries, what Ukrainians were actually doing with their ability to unite as a diverse but collective group was to send needed aid to the rest of the world. They'd been reminding the rest of the world what's worth fighting for. Um, in, in Ia's words, for the freedom to rest in a land of love for children's futures. Um, so I'll just read these two lines quickly. We've packed a contraband humanitarian aid kit of war songs and shipped it to Europe, America, India, and China, paving the Silk Road with great Ukrainian literature. What have you got there, brothers? They ask at the borders. Silence dressed up in Cyrillic letters, the sacred fire of the candlelight letter, Yi. Our and your freedom to rest in a land of love like the broken trees of distant memory. 
So, you know, this remarkable ability to present a kind of united front as a country doesn't happen automatically. It helps to be invaded. I don't recommend it. Um, but one of the reasons that Ukrainians have been so united, I think, is that there had already been this shift in thinking about what it means to be Ukrainian since the Revolution of Dignity in 2013, 2014. If ethnic Ukrainians quite recently had a strong sense of ethno-national identity, right? Who were your parents? What, you know, what was their religion? Uh, that was separate from Jewish, Tatar, Roma, and so forth. That's been changing with a new generation. So how can a country shift from thinking of belonging on an ethno-national level, religion, language, ethnicity, to thinking about it on civic terms, defined by citizenship across ethnic groups? Uh, well, I believe Ukraine is at this moment of declaring its independence. And while this process might suggest a temptation to become more focused on ethno-national particularism, this is certainly still a risk, many intellectuals, poets, and artists have worked to simultaneously encourage the growth of this civic idea of Ukrainianness. Hmm. Um, let me make sure that I am able to see my next slide. Oh, there we go. Um, it's just stacked. Okay, so Ukrainians had been moving increasingly toward this civic understanding of Ukrainian identity that was centered on citizenship, what's your passport, passport as opposed to parentage for, for a little while. Zelensky's rise to the presidency in 2019 as a Russian-speaking Ukrainian of Jewish extraction is proof for some of this shift toward a pluralistic Ukrainian identity. Um, but it certainly isn't the only evidence. Since the Revolution of Dignity, Ukrainians and scholars of Ukraine have observed, have observed what many have called, have termed a civic turn. And Maria Nikianovska, the same poet that I shared with you a moment ago, um, a couple of years before she even began writing Babi Nyar, spoke out in 2014 about a reappraisal of Ukrainian identity. For me, especially after the Maidan, she wrote, it suddenly became clear that all this is actually we. It's a multi-level I. Um, and, uh, you know, in the years since the outbreak of the Donbass War, especially Ukrainian social science scientists, as well as American social scientists working on Ukraine, have observed this gradual shift in Ukrainian identity formation. This is Karina Karostelina of George Mason University. A civic multicultural narrative, she writes, represents a new shift away from both a Ukrainian national narrative, which doesn't leave room for the civic, and the Soviet-influenced neo-imperialist narrative. So we can hardly credit Zelensky for this shift. If anything, Zelensky's election to the presidency in 2019 says more about the Ukrainian voting population than about him. Nonetheless, Zelensky's emphasis on citizenship over ethnicity as the defining feature of Ukrainian identity, both before and during his presidency, has helped to normalize this idea of, of pluralism. Um, this is just a, a sketch that he did on his Quartal 95, his vaudeville comedy TV show that he ran uh, before his presidency. Um, in you know, this bit he about you know, playing the violin, he said, if things had turned out the way my mother wanted, I would have been a violinist. And then he goes on to say, yeah, like a good Jewish boy, I played the violin. And then he starts to play the violin, and he's terrible, and you know, it's all very funny. Uh, so the idea that Zelensky is supposed to be a good Jewish boy expands this idea of national sensibility in Ukraine um, to include ethnicities that were not necessarily viewed as included, uh, even in the, the moment of the fall of the Soviet Union. And this pluralist comedy is modeled, obviously, in part on American Borscht Belt humor, in part on certain aspects of Soviet humor, um, but is ultimately striving towards something earnest and organic, a redefinition of civic values uh, in contemporary Ukrainian terms. So the ability to translate ethnically specific tragedies, be they Babi Nyar or you know, Jewish jokes, into a collective Ukrainian experience has been essential to Ukraine for the last 20 months as the country has needed to pull together, not only militarily, but also culturally, to oppose the suggestion that Ukrainians and Jews, for example, were separate entities um, at war with one another. Um, but I do believe that the concerted effort toward a pluralistic Ukrainian sphere uh, began about a decade ago. 
Um, and this is, you know, an image from the from the Maidan, from the uh, the Maidan Nizalejnisti, where the Revolution of Dignity took place. Um, and it, it began to be clear. And I was watching this. I was like on maternity leave when the Maidan happened, so I can I can measure the the age of the Ukrainian war by my son's age. Um, but watching from afar, watching from California, I was seeing these remarkable things happen. Rabbis were getting up to give speeches to, you know, Ukrainian nationalists, including like people that were members of far right groups that were also merged with people that were members of left wing groups. Um, this is the Pushkin Klezmer band appearing on the Maidan stage in December of 2013. Um, Jews in Ukraine, uh, in Ukraine played a very visible role. Uh, Rabbi Yaakov de Bleich, who is you know, recognized as the chief rabbi of Ukraine, um, got up and spoke about Ukrainian solidarity. Um, and for many people, this represented an opportunity to create something absolutely new, a society that was neither Soviet nor right-wing nationalist. It represented a kind of third way, particularly for those East European thinkers who'd lived through the East European revolutions of 1989, which anti-Soviet dissidents celebrate as a kind of Hegelian end of history, um, as Francis Fukuyama described it. Uh, Ivan Kratsev and Stephen Holmes have written about the widespread disillusionment with this ideal in their book, The Light That Failed. Uh, they write, Fukuyama's end of history involves an obligatory imitating of ends, not means. This is why it qualifies as a psychologically problematic and even traumatic transformation of East-West relations. But what's more interesting for my own purposes is the role that Jewish history has played in engendering this anti-essentialist cultural sphere since 2013. Um, uh, here, I need to switch slides. Uh, so let's go back to what was being responded to. Um, there was a lot of Kremlin-aligned rhetoric at the time about Ukrainians and Jews. Uh, right as the Maidan was getting started, Putin got up and said, you know, in one of his speeches, the events in Ukraine are more reminiscent of a pogrom than a revolution. This is from 10 years ago. Um, and a bit more recently, but before the full-scale invasion, during the lead-up to the full-scale invasion, Medvedev talked specifically about, about Zelensky. He said, the current president of this tormented country is a person with certain ethnic roots. Out of fear of getting another Maidan, right? Read pogrom, that's the translation for Maidan into Russian in Kremlin terms, um, directed against his personal power, he completely changed his political and moral orientation. In fact, he renounced his identity. So he's calling him a bad Jew for not being closer to Russia. Um, the, um, obviously, the emphasis, the simultaneous emphasis on contemporary pluralism in Ukraine has been frustrating to those close to the Kremlin who have really built their war against Ukraine on the premise that the country is dangerously ethno-nationalist. Um, Putin's language of, of fascism, nationalism, Nazism is reviving Soviet-era shibboleths that suggest an idea of protecting ethnic minorities, including Jews, from Ukrainian supremacy. They've really doubled down on this. Um, and this rhetoric kind of combines history with propaganda. The Kremlin and its allies are patterning the current struggle in Ukraine on a World War II narrative. They're suggesting that Russia represents a positive force for internationalism, whereas the West allows the flourishing of neo-Nazi movements. And yet, of course, Russia is attacking uh, Ukraine that has one of the lowest rates of anti-Semitism on the eve of, of the war, including uh, in Europe. And, uh, you know, the inconsistency between Putin's accusations and Zelensky's Jewishness has also worked in the favor of, uh, of Ukraine's increasing pluralism. It's helped Ukraine to make, uh, you know, what I consider to be the right responses to, uh, to this. So it's, it's been convenient rather than necessarily um, the instigator of, of some of these conversations. So embracing a civic version of the inclusive we is a way for Ukrainians to address multiculturalism, again, on its own terms. So I want to say a few things about history, the troubled history, and I'll only talk about a few moments, but, but it's worth bringing that up. I, I think it's, a, um, it's important to acknowledge the fact that the relationship between Jews and Ukrainians is imperfect. It has historically been very, very troubled. Uh, one of the reasons Ukrainian-Jewish relations is so interesting is that the two groups have a fraught history. Um, this is one of the reasons I think it's worth studying. Uh, there are plenty of historical moments that can be mentioned. I'll just mention a few. Uh, Jews, Ukrainians, and Russians 
uh, often refer to Bogdan Khmelnytsky's rule, that's the handsome guy on the left, uh, albeit in very, very different ways, as the origin story in inter-ethnic relations in Ukraine. Khmelnytsky was the Cossack leader who oversaw a rebellion against the Polish magnates in 1648. Uh, in the process, Khmelnytsky's men massacred tens of thousands of Jews. Um, so in Jewish history, including in Jewish liturgy, Khmelnytsky, the period of Khmelnytsky, is remembered as a kind of, you know, one of the many tragedies that have befallen Jews throughout history, one of the, the original European genocides. Uh, the, um, the Russians, on the other hand, have viewed Khmelnytsky as a kind of, you know, kind of cautiously as an ally. Because in 1653, after having carved out for really the first time in history a Cossack state, Khmelnytsky, in need of a way of protecting that state, ended up signing a treaty with Muscovy in order to hand over those lands to Muscovy. And this is celebrated and even referred to still by the Kremlin today as the original moment when Ukraine promised its allegiance. Why isn't it being good? You know, you promised back in 1653. Um, and, you know, over, over history, this moment, 1653, is celebrated as a moment of brotherhood. Uh, Ukrainians have viewed Frelnitsky with a mixture of pride. Obviously, he was the first to lead. He was kind of the George Washington. He was the first to lead this rebellion that, that created a Ukrainian free state. On the other hand, he gave over that territory to what would turn out to be an, an imperialist force. Uh, Taras Shevchenko, the great Ukrainian romantic poet, wrote in uh, 1859, if only you drunken Bogdan could look at Periyaslov now. Yak toti Bogdan ne pjanle to perna Periyaslov glianu. So for Shevchenko, Khmelnytsky was not a nation builder, but a compromiser and in some ways a, a traitor. Right? What did he do? Why did he give that over to the, the, wrong, the wrong side? In Tsarist Russia, Ukrainians and Jews were problematic minorities dominated, um, uh, you know, that dominated Russia's imperial anxieties at various points during the long 19th century. The early 19th century was a period when the empire was still consolidating its rule over the Western territories, over the Pale of, of Jewish Settlement, which is carved out here in dotted lines. Um, but that was also the territory where Jews coexisted with other Slavs, especially with Ukrainians. And um, you know, there had been these Polish uprisings, especially those of the early 1830s and of 1848, that made the czars very, very worried about a potential Ukrainian uprising. So Ukrainians were somewhat of the model minority in the early uh, 19th century, whereas Jews uh, became much more significant in the kind of Russian imperial anxiety in the later 19th century. The Jewish question became a, a, very, a very big problem, especially in the 1880s when uh, there were these anti-Jewish pogroms that led to legislation to further restrict Jews' mobility within the Tsarist Empire. So in this long century, the communities that coexisted in the Pale of Settlement uh, viewed one another with skepticism. They often described the uh, you know, ethnic other through these parodic kind of puppet-like portrayals. And we can think of Gogol and his Jews who you know, always look a little bit ridiculous. They're sort of in league with the devil. They seem to be borrowed from the Commedia dell'arte inspired Vertep puppet theater. Um, and this is sometimes how Ukrainians would describe Russians and Ukrainians would describe Jews and Jews would describe Ukrainians. There was a sort of distance. Um, and uh, you know, this, of course, comes in part because there really was very little interaction in many places. Of course, you had neighbors who knew each other, especially women, but most interaction was through commercial exchange, marketplace exchange, um, affairs where people would see each other in a competitive environment. Um, and of course, there were these, these key moments of violence. Once Ukraine was incorporated into the nascent Soviet Union in the early 1920s, and this was following moments of independence during the Ukrainian Civil War, the Soviet Union did its best to simultaneously capitalize on Ukrainian national sentiment to claim a national liberating agenda that was anti-Tsarist, right? That was, that was post-Tsarist, even as it established what was effectively a new form of Russian imperial control. Um, and one mechanism for doing this was the short-lived concept of indigenization, 
uh, or um, as well as, uh, as communist internationalism. So using this rubric of national form and socialist content or proletarian content, depending on the moment, uh, the Soviet government managed to both offer Ukrainians a kind of trace amount of what they had long awaited, Ukrainian language schools, the ability to publish in Ukrainian, a Ukrainian film studio, a territory that was nominally Ukraine, um, while still criminalizing national sentiment. Um, there was, to be sure, a kind of infectious hopefulness in this period. Writers in marginalized languages, including Ukrainians and Jews, were given venues and salaries to produce work. Translation was heavily funded. You see here uh, one of many translations that the Yiddish poet David Hofstein did. Of uh, This is of Taras Shevchenko. He actually published several in 1939 to commemorate the 125th birthday of Shevchenko. They're really beautiful translations, by the way. Um, and, uh, you know, there were a number of others there, Hofstein and, and um, other Yiddish poets were translating their contemporaries. They were translating Pavlo Tuchina, Maxim Rilski, other writers who were writing in Ukrainian. They were starting to see each other as colleagues. Um, so this was a moment of, it was, it was a moment of rapprochement, and I don't want to turn away from that. Um, that was something that, you know, good that came out of that, that socialist impetus, although it all went south. Um, Curiously, the monographs that often accompanied these translations um, were a kind of unlikely space to think about the place for nationhood in the Soviet Union. And I'll just you know, read these couple of examples. Uh, Petro Altman wrote in one of his monographs of, of Shevchenko, nowhere have the masses valued their Kobzar as highly as here in our Soviet Union. The Kobzar is Shevchenko, under the flag of Lenin, Stalin, all peoples live free in our land. They build and create their cultures to be national in form and socialist in content. Um, David Hofstein, in one of his introductions, wrote, only the proletariat under the leadership of the Bolshevik party of Lenin, Stalin, led the peasant to battle. Right? He's suggesting that somehow Stalin freed Shevchenko from serfdom. It's, it's, it's preposterous, but it's actually really interesting because what it seems they're really talking about here is how to think about nationhood and how to think about national struggle, even at a time when national struggle was starting to become taboo. And you know, one of the things that they seem to be saying is that there actually is a place to talk about what is national in content if you're talking about someone else's nation. So writing about Ukrainians became a Trojan horse for writing about Jewishness. Um, increasingly, both during and after the Stalin years, Ukrainian and Jewish writers were accused of ethno-nationalism. David Hofstein, who you see here, was shot in 1952 in Lubyanka together with a dozen other Yiddish writers, artists, and cultural figures. Um, there are numerous examples on the Ukrainian side, too. I mean, the, one of the most famous is Vasil Stus, who died of hunger in a prison camp on a hunger strike in, in the mid-1980s. Um, but this, this joint experience of a new form of imperial imp oppression sometimes had the effect of encouraging what Dominic Le Capra has called competitive victimhood among ethnic groups with anti-imperial grievances. Um, so sometimes, you know, Ukrainians would look at Jews and say, well, they only care about the Jews. Why are they always talking about the pogrom still? Why aren't they talking about the Holodomor and, and vice versa? Um, so there were moments of rapprochement, but it, it was not all good. Um, so let's just talk about these two key events that the poets are, are writing so much about. Uh, the competitive victimhood that I just mentioned was compounded by the suppression of any form of commemoration of Babin Yar, right, this, this mass killing during the Holocaust, and the Holodomor in the early 1930s. Um, just to say a couple more things about Babin Yar, which is commemorated here on the left, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this um, over the course of the conference. In late September 1941, uh, over 30,000 people um, in the course of just a couple of days were mass murdered by gunshot. Um, there were also Roma, Crimean Tatars, and, and communists, Ukrainian and Russian communists that were killed. Um, commemoration of the event was officially forbidden in the first quarter century after the massacre, and unofficial gatherings were criminalized and linked to Zionism. Scholars also estimate, to say something about the Holodomor, scholars estimate that close to 4 million Ukrainians perished of starvation during the Holodomor or the Ukrainian famine in 32, 33 alone, alongside a mass death of, of livestock due to lack of feed. And it arrived on the heels of rural collectivization, which had been enforced in the late 1920s. 
Um, so the Great Famine was in part the result of poor harvests, but in large part the direct result of unattainable production quotas that had been set by Moscow. In the Soviet Union, the Holodomor was neither acknowledged nor commemorated. Similarly, specifically Jewish losses in Babin Yar were long alighted. Even when there was a memorial placed in Babin Yar during the Soviet years, it was to the losses of peaceful Soviet people. Um, so Babin Yar complicates this narrative of Soviet anti-racism that you know, many want to talk about when they talk about anti-colonialism as linked to a socialist past. Um, is this lack of acknowledgement of, of horrific instances of geno genocide betray the shortcomings of what Terry Martin has called an affirmative action empire. The effect of excluding both Ukrainian and Jewish loss from Soviet collective memory was that the commemoration of tragedy became ethnically specific and in some case, cases evolved into opposition against one another. I do want to say that in some cases, there also were shared experiences of loss that created moments of solidarity, especially among dissidents. In the 1960s, as um, Yohanan Petrovsky Stern has written about very recently, Babin Yar became a fortuitous site of joint commemoration. Um, at the 25th Yord site of Babin Yar, for example, there were these Ukrainian speakers that, that especially Ivan Zuba, um, who, um, who arrived at Babin Yar on their way to commemorate the, um, the centennial of the suppressed Ukrainian historian Mikhail Khrushchevsky. And there's a beautiful speech that you can read by, by Ivan Zuba about Ukrainian and Jewish solidarity. But paradoxically, in the post-Soviet years, acts of ethnically specific mourning were often clouded by competitive victimhood, by this idea that we need to commemorate our own. So a renewed dialogue between Holocaust and Holodomor memory enables a reconsideration of, of identity categories that were established in the Soviet period. A time when, as Francine Hirsch has made clear, nationality had become a fundamental marker of identity embedded not just in the administrative structure of the Soviet Union, but also in people's mentalities. Am I, am I okay for time? Okay, okay. Oh, it's my floor, I'm just gonna keep going. Okay, I've got, I have some more poems that I'd, I'd like to share pieces of. So I wanna quickly return to this poem that I've already um, introduced you to by Kianowska. And I wanna now get into this concept of the poetic password. I wanna argue that the concept of the poetic pass password is useful for understanding what's taking place today. In these lines, Kianowska is, of course, unearthing these competing traumas. Um, but for Kianowska, 33, right? Just, just mentioning 33, the year of the, the worst deaths in the Holodomor, is a version of what Derrida, writing about Paul Ceylon, has referred to as a cipher for the un otherwise unaccessible experience. Um, to cite Derrida, the word that opens the possibility of mourning what has been lost without remainder. Kianowska then uses this cipher, 1933, together with another historical cipher, 1941, to grant Jews access to a collective experience of Ukrainian loss. And she's likening these communities within the language itself. In the opening of this passage that I have here, Ivan, you can see Ivan and Navi in the, in the dative case, are palindromic anagrams of one another. And they're mirror images. They, they represent separate collective tragedies, but they're mirroring one another. And what these names end up leading to is the observation that rather than Babylon, the place of language, we're left with silence. The proximity of the sounds in the words is important here to Kianowska. Movwe, languages, slips into movchani, silence. Language becomes silence. Kianowska is suggesting in these lines that it's through the experience of others suffering that we begin to understand our own. Viewing another life from the outside allows individuals, as Bakhtin has formulated, to sympathetically co-experience, that is to better know themselves. Kathy Carruth, speaking more specifically about empathy, has observed that trauma, and I'm quoting Carruth here, may lead to the encounter with another through the very possibility and surprise of listening to another's wounds. So Kianowska, of course, is, is entering a tradition of writing about the tragedy of other groups. Uh, we have Sylvia Plath's Daddy, uh, Marina Tsvetaeva's poem of the end. And I've, as I've said, writing about other groups was actually an important aspect of Soviet internationalism. At first as an official act of collectivity and later as a dissident Trojan horse, perhaps, to talk about the, the oppression of, of minority groups. 
And this includes, of course, poets of the past that have described Babinyar, beginning with Mykola Bajan, who in 1943, not long after the freeing of, of Kiev, described human remains in the muddy earth. So 75 years before Kianovska, he's also giving voice to the dead. In some ways, the contemporary spirit of a collective we looks a little bit like these idealistic acts among leftists, minus the Moscow-aligned authoritarianism. So we have, and this is, this is my translation, a muddy clay green pit, ruddy abyss, a rotted out ravine full of decay. So he's really describing what he sees rather than, rather than putting voices to it. Um, and of course, the best known example of an early Babuinyar poem is Yevtushenko's, where the poem is very much about the lyrical I. It's about this, this voice. Um, it seems I'm Dreyfus. This is me, he says. So the, in the aftermath of this, of this publication, it is well known. Uh, uh, the, the editor of Literaturne Gazeta, where it was published, had to resign. But then, of course, it was resurrected in places like Shostakovich's uh, 13th Sympathy, uh, Symphony. Um, so there's a number of Babinyar poems that are written by non-Jewish Russians or Ukrainians. Um, and and Kinov is, of course, part of this tradition. I see her doing something slightly different in that she's bringing Ukrainian tragedy and Ukrainian voices specifically into dialogue with Jewish voices. Um, it would be hard to exaggerate the role of the Holocaust in, uh, in today's poetry. It's everywhere. We are, when you talk to poets, they talk about wanting to only really read Holocaust writers because it gives them a sense of what's going on right now in Ukraine. And then you, you find them everywhere in poetry. This is a, a poem that we included in this book by Helena Kruk. The Holocaust could happen because the Holodomor went unpunished. One unnoticed, unpunished evil on a massive scale led others to assume they too would get away with everything. So in this poem, uh, the two events are, I believe, still being used as shibboleths. They're still being used as passwords to create a collective experience. But Kruk is aiming to not just compare the two events, but to reveal a kind of direct causality. Um, well, despite obvious historical and ideological differences between Soviet Jewish writers in the 1930s and progressive Ukrainian poets of the 2020s, both groups are experiencing a moment of nation building with diametrically opposed end goals in mind. Um, but both do possess an internationalist ethos. Um, and I find that this group of Ukrainian writers, my own contemporaries, are incredibly compelling for their attempt to describe the other with all the naive naivete that that entails. Well, around the same time she began sharing her poems about Babin Yar, Kianovska posted the following to Facebook. And she was just sharing these online because that's what Ukrainian poets do. They share drafts, they comment on each other's drafts, they translate them. It's, it's kind of an amazing space. She posted, people are asking if I'm Jewish. I'm not Jewish. I don't think any Jewish blood flows in my veins, but I'm human. I can feel what another person is feeling. I can imagine how the Jews felt when they were being taken to be shot or what they felt in front of the gate to the crematorium. That's why I write, I am Rachel, because I can feel like Rachel. I am Rachel, and yes, I left the suitcase on the road today amid the smoke, and all I brought to Babin Yar was my Jewish name and a lot of pain. So in this post, we see Kianovska in the process of working through what it means to empathize across cultural, ethnic, or historical boundaries. This might be still somewhat unreconstructed in its idea of empathy, but she's very intentionally creating a conversation. And, you know, Kianovska's metaphorical identification with the Jewish victims of Babin Yar might be read as a version of something that Michael Rothberg has called solidarity via identification. Rothberg has discussed a well-meaning American anti-racist declaration around the time of the Trayvon Martin shooting, where people would say, you know, they'd post to social media, I am Trayvon Martin. And, you know, this was in the wake of this horrible 2012 murder of an unarmed black teenager. Although the statement of solidarity was important, Rothberg has discussed the choice by some white allies to the black community to instead write, I am not Trayvon Martin, a statement that Rothberg views as an occasion to mark another kind of belonging, the speaker's imp implication in the condition that contributed to Trayvon's murder. Um, in some cases, they you know, would even identify with the perpetrator. So Kianovska's I am Rachel uttered alongside her assertion that I am not Jewish 
occupies some kind of space in between. It's between identification and disidentification. Ukrainians who have confronted a history of anti-Semitism on Ukrainian soil must constantly negotiate between the occasional role that Ukrainians played in, Jewish, in, in anti-Jewish violence and the mass loss of Ukrainian lives and limitations on Ukrainian freedom that has played an important role in conceptions of Ukrainian nationhood. So Kianowska is writing about Jewish history at a moment when this is at once necessary to Ukraine's civic identity and very politically complicated, given the strong connection in the collective Ukrainian imagination between the ongoing war, um, you know, at the time that she wrote it was still limited to the Donbass, and past episodes of violence against Ukrainians, including the Holodomor. Well, other Ukrainian poets of Kianovska's generation and younger tended to be the best equipped to understand Kianovska's project, and their reviews I find to be the most helpful. The poet and rock star Serhii Zhadan wrote a review of Kianovska's book where he observed, our historical traumas are strongly interconnected. The poet Iakiva wrote, um, Kianovska reinforces an important question for art, the right to interpret someone else's experience. Are we only prepared to bury our own dead and to mourn our own victims? Well, whereas Kiva, like Rothberg, sees the value in writing consciously about another group, many of the responses that Kianovska got on Facebook when she first shared her poems suggest a kind of general inability to separate Jewish trauma from Ukrainian trauma. One reader responded to her post that I just shared with you about not being Jewish um, by saying that, you know, uh, they probably all share genetic material anyway. She said something like, you know, through every Ukrainian flows a bit of Jewish blood. Kianovska rejected this offhand and said, oi boja, right, oh my god, don't start. Uh, for Kianovska, it's significant that identification and responsibility should be separate from individual family lineage. So I bring in these, these naive comments not to demonstrate the unstruggled nature of Ukrainian Facebook users in 19, 2016, but, uh, but instead to show that these poems are emerging from conversations about identity that are still going on and that are still in process. The rock star Slava Vakarin, and politician, he was briefly running for president against Zelensky and then pulled out. The rock star uh, Slava Vakarchuk, he's the, the front man in the band Okean Elzi, uh, elevates Babin Yar to something higher than other Ukrainian collective tragedies. For, um, he sort of pushes this current discussion about civic society uh, when he says the memory of Babin Yar is a foundation stone that can lead us to an inter-ethnic dialogue. So it has meaning for him. Um, in its possibility of creating some sort of reconciliation. And for Vakarchuk, that's actually more important than national mourning. Not that everyone agrees, but there are people saying these things. So these references to specific historical moments um, allow for the translation across ethnically specific memories. And I wanna get to uh, my final concept that I, that I wanted to, to bring home, which is this idea of unearthing erasures. Ultimately, the goal of this process is to unearth things that had not been discussed, to allow multiple tragedies of the past to help move the present society somewhere different. Um, Iakiva wrote this Russian language poem, this is just the, the first few lines, shortly after fleeing her native Donetsk for Kiev. Uh, here's a country, it remembers Chernobyl, the Holodomor, Babunyar, the dissidents, and the light up red star, and the hatchet that proudly hung over already bruised necks, an enormous line for a permanently closed kiosk. So what we see happening is that poets are mentioning all of these things together. It's becoming like obligatory to have a, a list of things. This is dated August 29th, 2014. That's actually the same day as the Battle of Ilovaisk, which had been to that point, the deadliest single day in the Donbass war. At least 366 Ukrainian soldiers were killed as they tried to retreat um, by, by shelling. And the, the poem actually ends with the lines, here we lie naked in God's palms, hiding big words in our, in our puppet bodies. Meanwhile, someone small switches us to silent mode, barely audible in the noise of our epoch. So it's the poet's job, Kiva is suggesting here, to turn the sound back on. As the American poet Muriel Rukeyser has written, uh, what three things can never be done, forget, keep silent, stand alone. So the connections between the war in Donbass, Babin Yar, and the Holodomor 
is a recurring theme in contemporary poetry about trauma in Ukraine, the memory of large episodes in history, episodes that are forgotten by some but remembered by others, is a way of calling attention to the current trauma that's playing out now throughout all of Ukraine at the time that she wrote this in Donbass. Ukrainian collective passwords help us to understand how Ukrainians view the ongoing war, uh, which began in Donbass and has now consumed the entire country. Uh, so Babinyar, Chernobyl, Holodomor are also these times. We are still living in those moments. This is a poem from 2020 by Helena Kruk, where Kruk compares the period of her own coming of age, the turn of the 21st century, to a kind of femme fatale that makes writing poetry difficult. But she's then also comparing all of this to the fateful years of early Stalinism. Uh, the poem begins, fatal and inconsistent as NEP, the new economic policy. She aims her bangs at you. This is a double meaning. The, you know, the bangs are also sort of like a, a cannon. Um, the poet's muscles are slack as a millstone in 33. But don't give her a word or she'll take them all. So the presumed subject of this poem is the turn of the 20th century but the, sorry, of the 21st century, but the points of comparison are to the new economic policy of the early 20th century and also to the Ukrainian fam uh, famine to 1933. This second person addressee is arguably some kind of amalgamation of contemporary Ukraine, um, maybe someone who hasn't taken side yet in the war. Um, and she's also talking about the, uh, the, need, the need to squirrel things away. Don't give them everything. Don't give them all of your grain. Don't give them all of your poems. They'll just take everything. Okay. Another poem that I uh, wanted to share with you, Iakiva uh, writes a lot about her mixed heritage, Ukrainian, Jewish, and Russian. And she uh, uses her own family as an example for unearthing some of these, some of these erasures. In, uh, Advance my own slide. Here we go. Uh, this is a poem from 2017, and we have a present map of Kiev that can't be disentangled from the geography of the past. So this is just the very beginning of the poem. It's quite a poem. I live between Babu Yar and the city of Every day as I return home along the way to death, I find myself in the war, the future. Then she goes on to talk about how her family found it place to the thought. They say we had a clairvoyance in our family, and my uncle in Bluma ended up in Donbass. Everyone else ended up being massacred on the airfield outside of Berdice, which was a similar event to Babin Yar in the early 1940s. So this Jewish shuttle of Berdice here um, is superimposed on cave. On the, on the poetic map of Kiev, Kiva's trauma. Babin Yar and the Siretz camp are actually both outside, just outside of the center of Kiev, and Berdichev is this former shtetl 100 miles away, um, but she's living all of them at once in, in living the past. If the family's Soviet fate preserved the uncle and Bluma, it destroyed the memory of Berdichev Jews. And she goes on in the poem to talk about how someday she would walk through Berdichev and look for the house and it wouldn't be standing anymore. Thanks, Comrade Stalin, for the, for the memory. So for Kiva, the victims of the Holocaust in Ukraine are victims of two regimes of erasure, both Hitler's killings and Stalin's unwillingness to commemorate Jewish loss. This double erasure for Kiva links the experience of Jews in Ukraine to that of the ethnic Ukrainian peasants millions of whom perished in the early 1930s. The use of history in contemporary war poetry has a couple of different functions. It allows poets to share history across the many geographical and cultural groups that are coexisting in Ukraine. But another part, another reason to do this is to address um, the present, is to address how we are going to live with our past moving forward. Kruk writes very explicitly of the dangers of erasures and silences in this poem from 2020. We stopped digging deep long ago in this uncertain field of ours, yours, right? Because all kinds of junk can turn up, human bones, horses' heads, unexploded mines, a battle ax, the peg that marked the border between our side and yours. So for Kruk, like for Kianovska, the physical composition and decomposition of the Ukrainian earth itself is the conduit for cultural conversations about history. 
Kruk describes the materiality of the soil that's sown with these victims of generations of trauma. Um, this ever contentious land is what keeps individuals stuck. This is sort of at the end of the poem she writes, when all our land stuck to our souls and doesn't let us take another step. But then paradoxically, the poem about unfound objects, about getting stuck, shifts into a poem about finding. And these horrific objects are all unearthed, rhetorically at least. So in this final image in the poem, Kruk is uh, comparing the collective Ukrainian inability to move forward to the physical relationship to hardened dirt. Um, Hannah Arendt has asked, what does it mean for history to disappear? And Kruk in some ways is asking the same thing. She's writing about history's buried artifacts, suggesting that when a buried history is unearthed, this too can be dangerous, but it may be the only way of getting unstuck. Well, I am drawing to a close and I wanted to bring in one more quote by uh, Kianowska that she wrote as, as her book was just coming out about Bobby Nyar. For me, only the tragedies, the Holocaust, the Hol Holodomor, the Volin tragedy, Chernobyl are in the same category. But the worst thing in these situations isn't that people die there. It's that when it comes to such deaths, the deaths of victims, these people are deprived of the dignity of death. And then she, she goes on to explain in another interview about her book that she actually started to write her poems about Babinyar as poems about Donbass. They were all about death, war, murder, and there were a few poems about real stories. And then she talks about how she'd been visiting Donbass since 2014. She'd been meeting with these Kharkiv volunteers. She talked to soldiers who hadn't come out of the trenches in six months, and they told these stories. But then when she, when she wrote them into poems, they were actually perceived as poems about Babinyar, and she was invited to read some of them at the Babinyar Memorial. Um, so memory is always political, and the war has accompanied an ideological struggle to resist a post-Soviet nationalist narrative in favor of a civic Ukrainian identity. And poets have been contributing to this conversation by suggesting that memory can reorganize conceptions of community. Kianovska, Kiva, Kruk, and others by attempting to embody the pain of others are imagining an inclusive version of their own nationhood. So just to sum things up quickly, my goal has been to discuss this expanding idea of a civic we um, that's taken shape in Ukraine over the last decade and how Jewish history has contributed to this. I believe this is part of what has kept Ukraine so admirably united over the past 20 months. In a way, as they're fighting Russia, they're also fighting the various specters of the past that Russia's government continues to insist upon. And the way that contemporary Ukrainian poets have used these, these passwords from other traumas, from various traumas, is to create a kind of deeper relationship to the past that's perhaps more interconnected. One that hopefully will not whitewash history, but will allow present society to draw different, perhaps better conclusions from it. My own very firm belief is that these poets are moving in the direction of a radical transformation of the idea of national identity. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that the process is not perfect. It's easier to identify with victims than with perpetrators. Uh, Ukrainians, by evoking Babin Yar specifically, are asking themselves to think about past tragedies, including what Ukrainians were, at least to some extent, complicit in. But there is not as much discussion of complicity as there is in the discussion of victimhood. So a lot of questions for the, for the future. And these are questions for all of you that hopefully we can continue to talk about over the course of the, the next two days. First of all, what's the correct balance between embracing a Ukrainian national history, for example, the Bandera movement, and accepting partial culpability for acts of genocide? This is something that's gotten some artists um, into trouble, right? Um, this, is, uh, you know, this, is, this is something that, that people have been implicated for. Um, how can commemorating Babinyar be institutionalized in Ukraine without backfiring and without being used against it by other sides? This is a big open question. I'm not part of the Babinyar Memorial, but I'm really, really interested in hearing more about it. Uh, what's the line between appropriation and inclusion? Uh, many people, when Kianovska's book first came out, uh, especially non-Jewish Ukrainians were very uncomfortable with what they perceived as, as potential um, appropriation. And I'm one who thinks that there can be acts of appropriation that are careful, 
but, but they do have to be done carefully. We have to figure out what, what, uh, what the result is going to be. And I think most pressing of all is whether this movement toward pluralistic remembrance is sustainable. War, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, radicalizes people, it radicalizes nations. The longer the war lasts, the less tolerant those sheltering from bombs will be. And what I'm describing is a process that began 10 years ago with the revolution of dignity, but it's fragile. So since February 24th, 2022, we've seen Ukrainian writers turn away very intentionally from Russian writers as well. There's a boycott of all Russian writers um, by Penn Ukraine. And I think an open question for Ukrainians will be how to navigate this. It's, it's a very understandable boycott, by the way. I get it. I'm not, I'm American. I totally understand that there's a need to, um, to, to protect oneself. But the question is, how will a civic society work within an international context? Um, so I want to I want to close with just a couple more lines by Kianowska. In some of the lines of her book, there's a sense that she's talking not only about the past but about the present, and maybe even about the future. And of course, this is the present, circa 2017. A lot has happened since then. But in this passage, we get a sense that the voice is not necessarily Jewish that blindness to what is taking place in Babin Yar affects the entirety of time in Cave. In Cave, something has happened not only to Jews, to time. Time's losing its future tense and its daily measure. Days missing the hour for respite, just raids and lies. So Dominic Lecapre discusses this idea of a founding trauma. He writes, the trauma that's transformed or transvalued into a legitimating myth of origins can, can be foundational. A crisis or catastrophe that disorients and harms the collectivity or the individual may miraculously become the origin or renewed origin of the myth and serve an ideological function in authorizing acts or policies that appeal to it for justification. The war in Ukraine has certainly made time out of joint, but rather than allowing it to supplant the original traumas of the Holodomor and Babinyar, poets have attempted to turn these moments uh, to turn to these moments to help bring the experiences of Ukraine's historical communities closer. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Amelia. Uh, this was fascinating. Uh, if anybody wants to start with a question, uh, I open the floor. I have some questions. Okay. Natalia and then uh, Jack, please. Uh, thank you. The, the, this was incredibly moving and, uh, and interesting, and I'm completely unfamiliar with this poetry, so thank you for introducing me to it. But, uh, again, I would need more time with these texts and you mm -hmm. cover <coughs> such wealth of voices uh, in however many minutes it was. And yet, I wonder if you talk now about appropriation and uh, and this hope for continued remaking mm -hmm. of the ident collective identity of you know, pluralistic, inclusive uh, 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 one. But I don't. I'm particularly struck by complete lack of engagement with the perpetration and collaboration. Uh, right? It's bones and. Mm -hmm. our bonds and these other bonds mm -hmm. that we're now willing to see. Uh, but there is huge silence in all these uh, mm -hmm. brave verses. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what you think about mm -hmm. it. Is there any inner discussion uh, that doesn't get translated into poetic verse? Uh, because if this is the mm -hmm. liberal progressive poets, it's, it's disappointing. Yeah, so, and a really, really important question. Thank you, thank you. This is, this is huge. I, I think the best example I can think of is Loznitsa's Babunyar, where he, uh, he brings... He's ostracized yeah. in Ukraine. Yeah. He's yes. He's yeah. It's, yeah. It's can dangerous. Can you just pick up... Uh, it's so dangerous. That, uh, yes, he's, he's ostracized. That, so Luz, let, me, let me just back up a little bit. Loznitsa made a film... A, a very ill-timed film, through no fault of his own, uh, the film came out during the build-up of troops on the border. 
uh, of Ukraine by Russia, and it's called um, Babunyar Context. Thank you. The but Context. We were thinking about watching it for this, right? And yeah. so it's a it's a film that Dragan will have much more to say about it than I do. But it's it's a film that uses documentary pieces found from both the Soviet archives and the Nazi the former Nazi archives, and. Uh, it's a very interesting film where he makes these equations between the build up of a national movement in a nationalist Bandera movement, Bandera style movement in Lviv. Uh, he shows pictures of Lviv you know, welcoming Nazis and then shows uh, what's taking place in Babin Yar. And it's, he's criticized, I think, fairly for forcing the viewer to draw all the conclusions themselves. Uh, so he's sort of saying, this is all happening, this is all Ukraine. But he's, it's, it's a brave thing, it's a brave act that he's doing because he's attempting to start a conversation. And he, he's, he's a filmmaker that does not shy away from controversy, he's, he was putting it out there. And um, the response was, was very negative, and there were some shortcomings, I think, to the film. There were, you know, there, he did not draw the through line himself, but, uh, but he was talking about perpetration. It was specifically a film about perpetration. And he was ostracized not for that. He's been ostracized for having appeared on a panel with Russian filmmakers or something, or officially, maybe. But it was probably that, maybe. I don't know. I'll let you talk. No, you can, you can fill in the details. But I know that um, it's a, and I've you know, spoken a little bit out about Lozmitsa. I, you know, I think it's important. I think it's incredibly important and incredibly brave. Um, it's a, uh, this is the danger. During a war, everything has to be towards the war, right? Of course. What's more important than that? Even discussing a civic society can't be more important than us all banding together to win the war. And so there is a very strategic drawing people in to identify with the victims. And there's a very strategic leaving out of perpetration. And I, I worry about that. And I, I don't want to whitewash that at all. Uh, but I am still hopeful that there's a conversation that's starting, that the competitive victimhood, I, one can hope. And I've had private conversations with Ukrainian writers, with, with you know, Ukrainian thinkers who say, my God, when are we just going to take down all those Khmelnytsky statues already? Uh, or the Bandera statues. But it's not necessarily something that people are saying in, in their Facebook posts. And I, I, I'm with you. It's, uh, you know, it's something that, that I'm watching. Um, but I also get it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, if I may just uh, to continue the conversation, Jack. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you want to? Uh, I would like to just uh, retort about um, yeah. Loznitsa. Please, yeah, yeah. Maybe you can correct me about what. Also, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I heard this criticism about Loznitsa, and uh, there, there are all these kind of uh, roundabout ways to actually. Mm -hmm. uh, Precisely criticize him for mm -hmm. engaging in this, in this traumatic experience of, of perpetration. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, why did he use German you know, footage? Mm -hmm. Well, this is just, this is what he works with, right? That is his aesthetics. Yeah. But my answer was precisely: uh, there are other redeeming factors. There mm -hmm. are Ukrainians who didn't participate, yeah. but this is what. He, as, an, uh, as, a, as a filmmaker, as a Ukrainian filmmaker, has a responsibility to go through this, specifically through this trauma, right? Mm -hmm. And that is a, 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 what must be done. You have to go through this mm -hmm. in order to come on the other side uh, of this uh, uh, catastrophe in some kind of civic consensus. On the other hand, uh, there is, I, I see, for example, in the election of of uh, Zelensky, 75 percent, and three quarters of the nation voted for him. Mm -hmm. The silent kind of mm -hmm. coming to terms with this. Yes, there is there is a monument. Yes, there, uh, you know, bandera. Yes, it, and it's very, you mm -hmm. know, it's, it's a minefield out there, literally and figuratively. But there is a, a, a kind of silent mm -hmm. consensus that that is that gives hope, right? You cannot discuss this now come to, to blows over this because it's mm -hmm. more. But it must be done. Yeah. You know? And there I see some kind of negotiation with this in this kind of silent you know, coming to terms with it. Yes, we have this, 
we may not all see. You know, there is Azov, uh, you know, uh, battalion mm -hmm. which uh, fights with Nazi insignia. But, you know, they ferociously defended the civilians and children and so on. Uh, uh, oh. And they are fraction, a margin of 0 0.02 of the electorate mm -hmm. are siding with that. Many uh, national, uh, you know, political landscapes in the West, including our own, have much more uh, electorate mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, by siding with, with, with mm -hmm. fascism and white supremacism. And we're in this moment when absolutely anything about Ukrainian perpetration of anything in history is being used as yet another weapon in the information war against them. And I, so one understands why the emphasis would be on let's all be a little more empathetic towards our non-ethnic Ukrainian histories for now. So my, my hope is that this is all a good sign leading to the future. But one of the reasons I haven't finished this book yet is that I... I don't think I can finish exactly this book about civic society until the war is, is over. It's too, it, it's too fragile. Yeah, maybe I'll write another one in the meantime, it's okay. There's other stuff to do. Poems to translate. Uh, Jack. Thank you, Julia. I, I, uh, many, many thoughts based upon your, your talk and, uh, and the mind, the jungle, so it's going to be hard to unscramble them and come up with some coherent. But one of the, one of them is that, and sort of, it's something to do with it, it's so much easier today to be a victim than to not be a victim. It's, it's a life you know, it's a zeitgeist. It's a, you know, we like victims today. It's partly why we like Nazis so much, because it makes it so much easier to know who's a good guy and who's a bad guy. So I'm sorry, sorry, sorry for being facetious, but it's one fascination with the uh, with Nazis. Yeah. But I think the other issue has to do with any national culture, the problems of um, you know, difficult history versus easy history. And Bobby is easy history. But when you deal with Ukrainians and the Holocaust, it's a difficult history for mm -hmm. Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. Perhaps in the same terms of dealing with which they oftentimes claim. The, you know, Jews and the commissars is a difficult history for Jews, even though they were putting the Greens and the commissars too. But, the, but it's easy to sort of blame this on some of the brethren and some of the But these are muddled, muddled history yeah. and difficult histories. So I think that's sort of the, the main point I want to say, uh, along with the fact that right after the war, I think that, that um, being a victim was not necessarily the right person to be. I mean, it is, I, <laughs> I like the concept of easy and difficult history because it's very, you know, you can take it all as a kind of lump thing, but of course it depends who you're talking to. So if, you know, if you talk about Babin Yar with a bunch of, let's say, I don't know, American Jews, it's, there's a clear, you know, there's a clear take on what Babin Yar is. It gets more complicated, I find, when I start to bring in, I, and I, I actually have talked in one or two kind of Jewish settings, synagogue settings, about this, um, this material. And I find that some American Jews will get very uncomfortable with the fact that is writing about it. So that makes it more complicated. Well, here it is, Babunyar, this place, among a lot of Ukrainians who want to talk about it. But the facile understanding of history is that those Ukrainians were all on the wrong side, which is not actually the case, but it's also, you know, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it gets messy depending on who's talking about it, I guess, right? Or who's using it for what. Yeah. Thank you, though. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Alice and then mm -hmm. um, The we is inclusionary, but the we is the borders of the war state. And the borders of the, of, are, are being bombed, and yes. the war will shift whenever this war is over, who the we is, and who the other is. So when Russian Jews become the other, in Ukraine or outside Ukraine or in Poland. I mean, I don't, 
the borders are a problem, and it sounds like they're going to, in other words, nationalism as a definition of the we becomes a problem. And I just have one other, this is maybe off the topic, but mm -hmm. I've read a lot of stuff on the people coming back from 1941 from the big battle, the Hungarian German on the Russian front, and they're coming back on foot, the Jews are coming back mm -hmm. on foot through Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And in every one of, the, of these discussions, both after, immediately afterwards and mm -hmm. later, the Russian peasants took them in, I mean, because they accept people who survived. So the Russian peasants gave them a place to sleep. The Ukrainian peasants So there is a problem that is, it's not just Bobby Yard, it's not just the big, it's also peasants living out in the middle of that, that area of farms out there. Yeah. Yeah, the we, by, by the inclusive we, it's, it, this is wartime, so it's, it's a very exclusive we, but it's a, it's a we that is not ethno-nationally rooted. And that's what I find interesting. The idea of the we is that, and what does ethno-nationalism mean? So we can, we can debate that, but the idea is that it is not based on parentage, religion, uh, race, as much as it is based on passport and uh, geographical affinity at this point. Um, so there's this idea that the we is people that are Ukrainian, that have chosen to live in Ukraine that are passport holders. Um, but yeah, it gets really complicated when you start to think about people that have moved around, and even in some cases, people who are immigrants to, to Ukraine. So how does that, how will that work? We supposedly have this very inclusive society in the United States, and yet, you know, what does our we look like? It's, it's, it's you know, I, I hope that we can learn something from the idea that it might be a a movable vision of identity, even if it's not perfect. Um, but yeah, I agree that war will war will make all of this very very messy. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, uh, culture and uh, uh, 
um, information policy. They all are engaged in whitewashing nowadays the, the history of memory about the buttons of Galicia. And our Zabushko and all these, you know, opinion makers in Ukraine, they are keep silence. So what is mm -hmm. most problematic nowadays in Ukraine is the instrumentalization of Baden Yar and the Holocaust of memory for political uh, for political election because Ukrainians do not want to address the question of perpetrators' local uh, uh, complicity in the Holocaust mm -hmm. and it's very it's shameful. Mm -hmm. So and you know what is very interesting all this rethinking let's say of we and inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, started after Maidan. But during Maidan, apart from classical music, we had mm -hmm. her back with Jew. Mm -hmm. And this Jew was portrayed in very stereotypical way. That's the yeah, that's the origin and of the of the Jewish year, portrayal. Our yeah. an article, I traced all these vertex, this uh, you know, in Ukraine uh, universities, mm -hmm. in Ukraine schools, in school, mm -hmm. former school of my son, mm -hmm. and I prepared the article and nobody was to publish this. They said it's not the right time to do this. And they yeah. said, you know, it's an anti Semitism. You can't develop a whole education yeah. by reinforcing ethnic stereotypes. You can't spread the hate speech and all these mm -hmm. stereotypes. And at the same time, call for action yeah. from, from other people. So I, I, I really want to, you know, to problematize this because what I witness now in mm -hmm. Ukraine is the rising of ethnic nationalistic history. And mm -hmm. we is very. Uh, yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you for saying all of these things because this is the this is the risk, right? This is the fear during a war. And I, you know. And after the war mm -hmm. now in Ukraine, the long, out of this, this yeah. is very dangerous. The longer it goes, the yeah. The longer the war lasts, mm -hmm. the, the stronger mm -hmm. this calls for we to solidify in this kind of yeah. And nowadays we experience the Wave of anti Semitism is uh, connected to this discussion about yeah. uh, as Galicia. I am just, uh, I am ashamed, I am embarrassed by it's, this discussion and the level of this discussion. It would be, know? it would be a, um, it would be a surrender to all of the Kremlin rhetoric to end up playing directly into the hands of what Ukraine was being accused of doing. Absolutely. Um, and this is the reason that I have not, I've kind of shifted away from writing about the civic identity stuff. Not that I'm not talking about it. I think it's really interesting. I think it's important to talk about, but I don't think we know what's going to happen. You know, we saw what happened in the Arab Spring, right? The war ends up radicalizing things. It all looks beautiful. And then, and then people have, there's a group think that happens when you have to band together. And this is so predictable, tragically predictable. Um, I, I would urge you to speak out because I think that what needs, I think there is the infrastructure there. You've got people like Vakarchuk, you have people like Jadan, you know, you have people like Iakiva and Kinovska who are putting these, and, and Kinovska is very brave with her willingness to speak out for, for, you know, various groups and even people that have been kind of canceled. Um, I, I think there's a next step that needs to take place, which is um, people need to be brave enough to publish articles like yours. People need to be brave enough to talk about um, the fact that these were victims. These weren't us. There are already people saying that. This wasn't me. It was another victim. And not just to compare. I, I'm not categorically opposed to comparing Babinyar to Izium. And I want to be careful about saying it because I know that's a, it's dangerous if you conflate the two. I think one of the reasons to study the Holocaust is so that we can prevent things like Ezeum from happening. And so bringing it up as a way of saying, world, pay attention to what's happening right now, I'm not, I'm not against that. But I, I absolutely agree with you that to be really, really shrewd about it, to really be able to talk about, you know, what, what are we doing with our SS legacies? And it's not everywhere, it's not a majority, but it's there. There's definitely a legacy of people who are collaborators. Um, I don't know. Is it? I mean, I, I I would love to see it happen now, even during the war. I mean, that would raise, <laughs> you know, the level of discourse astronomically. I it would be superhuman. I don't know if my country would be would be capable of it. Um, I'd love to think Ukraine is. Yeah. It's a hope. Yeah. Yeah. 
The dirty laundry has to be aired. It has to be aired. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is actually from Implicated Subject, the quote that I had, but yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, 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 mm -hmm. but I guess to this point, mm -hmm. as well, is, uh, you know, he, he, he deals with a very selective group of people, all of whom are of good will, mm -hmm. and yet weren't there. You know, like W.E.B. Dubois went to the war cell yet, yeah, but he wasn't in the war cell yet, you know? Mm -hmm. And so my question is about the method. Um, of this poetry, do they like? How do they write it? Do they do they go to a site of memory like Bobby R and just sort of ponder? And I, I don't mean I don't mm -hmm. mean to trivialize yeah. this. Or, or or are they you know doing deep research into these things? I, I'm just curious about the method. How, how do these things get put together? In the case of Kianowska, she was going to Donbass. She wasn't writing about Babinyar at all. I mean, she was. We wrote a whole book about Babinyar, but it was the what. If there was an urgency in it, it was because it was all being informed by what she was seeing take place in Donbass in those years, and that's I think what makes this poetry interesting. They're bringing in the illusions, the historical illusions, but they're actually writing about the present. Um, and it's not. I mean, she uh, she's an interesting case. She's written about how, as an adult, like really shamefully late, she learned that the small town where she grew up outside of Lviv had a massacre, had a massacre of Jews. And that was this kind of like life-altering thing because she didn't really know about the Holocaust. She didn't know how widespread the Holocaust was. She didn't know how close. And then she started to read more about that massacre in her town. And then she started to read more about the Holocaust. She started to read other poets who'd written about the Holocaust. So she kind of went down that road and then became consumed by it and then integrated it into her own thoughts. Um, so that's one side of things. A poet like Iakiva was kind of on a personal journey. She was taking courses in Hebrew. She was thinking about her own family as past and she was a refugee. So she was living in this place where it was closer to World War II, much closer than where she'd grown up. Um, and she starts to write about these things also contemporaneous to the war. Um, so I think what, you, what you're saying is interesting. I think that, um, I, so <laughs> you didn't ask about my own methodology, but, um, but about their methodology, but part of my methodology, which is really new to me, this is, I'm a, I have no business doing this, but I am anyway, is that I've created a, a database of contemporary poets, uh, poems that are being posted to social media. And I have this little, you know, little group of, of students, which is really fantastic, and they're helping me to analyze them. And one of the things that, that I did with a student last year was she created something called a, a Toke mean difference graph, where she took this data set of, I don't know, it's not that many poems, like 1,500 or something like that, 1,400 poems, and looked at the words that were, that were more prevalent before uh, or after 2022. And one of the words that just like shoots up on the prevalence list is historia, right? So words about history, um, words about obviously war, because we're talking about the present war, um, but certain moments in history start to become signposts for actually talking about the present. There are also some other unexpected things like neighbor and um, sister, brother, those things become, those connections somehow become more important. Maybe not surprisingly, words like love, words for seasons are much more before 2022, those things, those, that nice nature poetry is sort of fading away, sadly, also, because nature is also important. Um, so uh, history is a, is a theme when talking about the present. I think that was true about my, my Yiddish poets, too, though. They were all talking about, the, they were talking about the Inquisition and 
the past as a way of talking about the present. Uh, I think we're always doing that. Uh, yeah. These poets do well to revisit the tradition uh, that's of Germany or Europe yeah. after the Holocaust because these issues have been uh, up front uh, in, 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 uh, mm -hmm. philosophy. Yeah. I mean, that's Adorno, how do you know, actually, he said that you cannot find poetry of the uh, yeah. Auschwitz. Um, I think it can be written, but it has to be written otherwise. And they're doing it. However, there is a huge, uh, massive uh, uh, material mm -hmm. how they're including in their own uh, Paul Selan, who is for Germans. I started this work, don't me to look who are. <laughs> yeah. a, a, a huge number of, of uh, writers and filmmakers and are, uh, poets are from, from Ukraine, from yeah. Jewish. So, anyway, Paul Selan. Who said, uh, uh, going to Moore's question, that nobody can uh, testify for the witness, no mm -hmm. even Zoyk for the Zoyk. So there is a, an ethical limit to what you mm -hmm. can do. Uh, even if you live through the Holocaust, yeah. even if you're closest to it, you cannot testify for the one who has disappeared, right? Mm -hmm. That is uh, 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 immoral, if you want, unethical, mm -hmm. but you must, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you brought up the, and Ceylon is, is a really wonderful example because, of course, he, you know, I think one of the things that drove him to, you know, to, to his death was um, writing in German. The fact that he wrote in the language of the perpetrator, and we, yeah. Mm -hmm. with, the, with, the, with, the, with yeah. the language, of, with, it's a conflagration of linguistic conflagration where you write and you're burning. And that's why it's called the, the Aschenglory, the, yeah. the poem, which I just called yeah. him, and so I, that's mm -hmm. why. And Derrida wrote, of course, Colossal uh, Chibolet. Yes. Uh, um, Brigitte had a question, and maybe we, we could conclude with, oh no, Natalia, and then we could maybe conclude with Natalia you know, rest, but if there is a need to, to yeah, thank you for all these questions, by the way. I mean, this is really, Bridget, it's, uh, yeah. Yes, I have a question. Yes. I have a question. 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 Yes. Move China. Move China. Yes. The word is. Yeah. There is a lot of there's a lot of discussion of silence, and Ia Kiva as well, in, in some of her post uh, invasion poems also uses this concept of silence. Um, we're very deeply immersed in translating Ia right now, so she comes to mind. Um, yes, absolutely. I wanted to just say, I mean, to kind of build on what what you were saying, Dragan. Um, you know, the, the Adorno quote, you know, can you write poetry after Auschwitz? I think the, the, the burning question for me right now is how does one read poetry during an ongoing war? It's very messy. It's very, you know, it's not news, but it is also. It's coming from a place that all I as an American can really do is listen. And yet there is a, um, there are voices that are expressing things that are relevant to an international context. Um, that are important to amplify. So I think it's one of these zones that it's, it's, it's a hard hat zone, it's a messy zone. I think it's worth going there, it's worth talking about what we see on this vanguard and what direction we see it going. Uh, but I, I think an open question that I'm still dealing with and I'd love your thoughts on it is whether it's um, appropriate to write it. You know, what, what does one do in the midst of a war about drawing conclusions from the art that's being produced in it? Or is it best just to translate and kind of, you know, remain silent, as you know, as you've pointed out? It's interesting this last mm -hmm. uh, um, line, Mara Itak, who said, and from here I uh, read Varna, the war, 
А вона, вона і так усе забере. Вона війна, вона війна, війна і не Україна. dialogue. I, I mean, you know, Bakhtin famously wasn't very interested in poetry because it's so monologic. It's grandstanding. You just say your piece and then you're done and you go home. But uh, posted as it is on Facebook, it gets hundreds of comments sometimes. And there is back and there's a lot of back and forth. Um, granted, you can always ignore it. You, you have ultimate control. You can delete people's comments that they make. Um, you know, here's, you know, her original Facebook post from 2016, I guess, or some copy of it at some point. Um, and uh, they're, you know, they're, yes, yeah, she's making a statement that sounds pretty monologic. She's just standing up on a soapbox talking. Um, and yet she was also responding to all of the things that they're doing. So what I'm doing, and I can, I can just show really quickly because it's fun. Um, what I've been working on with my students is a, a, a database. The, the view looks a little bit like this. And uh, it's searchable by author, by theme, and, um, and also for a string of, uh, of characters. And we have not made this public yet because we're still trying to sort out how to do it with permissions. Um, there's, we could do it if we did a box just viewing, you know, with a view to the original Facebook post, but then there's a lot of broken links. Um, if we use our copy-pasted version, they may have changed something since we copy-pasted it. So they're not in complete authorial control anymore, and we've just gone through. These are all... These are all public posts, but nonetheless, with Facebook, you have some control over your public posts. So what we've done is we've gone through, we've, um, uh, we have a set, I, I created a list of poets that was actually based originally on the poets associated with the pen club, because I wanted some measure of, of objectivity. It wasn't just my friends, um, but then also the people that they're constantly posting and citing. And uh, there's nothing about the pen club that I particularly was trying to valorize, except that they're sort of universal. Um, we went through and we took all of their first, like first 10 posts from, first it was just 2014 and 2022. And then we started to fill in the intervening years so that we could get a little bit more of a sense of progression. Um, but we're doing all of this by hand. We don't have a scraper. Facebook makes it, it very hard to scrape things. So at this point, it's just like my students for extra credit or for pay, depending, uh, are going through and copy pasting into a Google form. Uh, and then, but then, you know, we can do fun stuff like this which is you know, looking at word co-occurrence um, using this whole data set. But what I was gonna say is that we also copy paste the comment section. So what I would ultimately really like to do is see the kinds of comments that poems produce. And one thing that I, I'm also tracking is, are there poems in the comment field? Because there are certain kinds of poems that seem to elicit other poems in response. Sometimes it's the humorous short ones. It seems that the shorter the poem is, I mean, we actually measured this, the shorter the poem is, the more likely it is to get a poem in the response. But um, often those are little funny ditties. People like Andri Bondar like to post these four line, really, really funny poems and they get funny responses. Sometimes they're translations of the original. Sometimes they're poems by famous poets that the person thought of. So it is dialogic. But it's dialogic and it's still in a sort of monologic way. There's still a lot of grandstanding. You don't have to listen. Can I ask about the word? Because in that chart, you showed us just mm -hmm. about, we showed us just a moment about the Zebe Hebreka. And so, you mean Hebreka? 
Oh yeah, not it wasn't a poem, it was her post, yeah. I, I have not seen Jadivka used for a while. And when I was living in Ukraine 20 years ago as a grad student, uh, it was still used occasionally, like on, sort of on the street or whatever, not, not in a marked way. And I've noticed at least in the poems that's shifted, language has shifted in that direction. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Emilia. Yes, thank uh, you. I, I should step down and let us have coffee. No, no. Um, thank you. This yeah. discussion is, is a t- testimony to, to the to the fascinating work that you are doing, and thank you so much. Thank for, you for having me, for and, for, and thanks for these questions. Please mm-hmm. uh, thank Amelia for.